That's the phrase that I want you to be thinking about instead of three words. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And the reason I want you to think about that, especially with our young people, is this. Is that these are the words your parents need to be repeatedly asking you as you grow older. When you're wanting to participate in certain things that your parents know that are not for your good, not in your best interest, those things that will draw you away from Christ that are unwise in the spiritual realm, your parents need to be asking you, what will you give in exchange for your soul? When you start um, venturing out on your own and having more independence and doing things that you weren't able to do before and you have less supervision, this needs to be one of the questions you're repeatedly asked. What will you give in exchange for your soul? I heard a man talking about this older preacher that was talking about when he was younger going to the movies. And he was able to go to the movie theater on his own. His parents would give him a certain amount of money. And he was able to get in and he was able to buy five candy bars. And he was under 12. When he turned 12, the price of tickets went up. And so he knew that if he went to the movie theater now that he's 12 years old, he wouldn't be able to get his five candy bars. He'd only be able to get four. And so he weighed the consequences of that, and he said, well, I want five candy bars, so yes, I'm still 11. And so he went back home and told his dad of his great wisdom and experience in the way that he beat the system. And his dad asked him this question, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And it was a matter of, would you give a candy bar in exchange for your soul, or receive a candy bar in exchange for your soul? It is an important question. And it's one that we're constantly engaging in. And we have to understand that this exchanging of goods when it comes to our soul is something where it's an inevitable question that we're going to have to face. If you go to Mark chapter 8, when Jesus is talking and, and asking this particular question, it is one that's rhetorical in nature, and we'll come back to that idea in just a few moments. But if you look at the context, and this is the same when you go to Matthew 16, where this exchange also takes place, it's the same here in Mark chapter 8 where this exchange takes place. It's also the same in Luke chapter 9 that we're going to be looking at in just a moment where this exchange takes place. The context is this, is that Jesus has had a discussion with his, uh, his apostles and he says, who do men say that I am? And you remember that they name off the, the great prophets of old. But he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter in, in Matthew 16 gives that response that you are the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus lets Peter know that this is something that's been revealed to you by God and not just by human intellect. This is not something that you've gained just from what you've just been able to see with your eyes, that you have spiritually perceived this thing. But then he also begins to tell Peter and the rest of them that he's going to go to Jerusalem, that he's going to be persecuted, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be crucified. And he says it very plainly to where they completely understand what he's saying. And that's when Peter, you remember, pulls Jesus to the sides and says, and begins to rebuke him and says, let this never be so, God forbid. And Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And that's when he gets into this discussion. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And in that instance, Peter was willing to sacrifice his soul so that he might have the fleshly embodiment of Jesus, his friend, who he exalted as being the Savior, not go through what he was going to go through. And in that moment of time, it's in that context that this is being talked about. If Jesus is actually the Christ, then this must take place. And you must be willing to accept it and to learn that that is the will of God. What will you give in exchange for your soul? In Luke chapter 9, and I want us to turn there now, Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. Again, this is the same type of situation that's taking place where Jesus, again, after he talks about his own crucifixion, he turns to his disciples after he called them to him in Luke 9, verse 23. And he says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he, and he himself is destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and in his holy angels. Notice that Jesus is talking about this idea of profit and giving something in exchange. In Luke 9, most of the time when we go there, and rightfully so, we talk about the demands of discipleship. And that Jesus, in the context of asking this question about the exchanging of our soul, he gives what the demands of a disciple are. You notice that one of the first things he says is that there's three demands that are listed. 
He must deny himself. But he also gives the reason. You have to get your own self out of the way because of, of this very reason, that whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. If you're seeking to save your own life, if you're willing to give up everything else so that you might have survival, you're not going to be an acceptable disciple of the Lord. You have to deny yourself. Here's the choice that you have to make. Someone has to be in charge. And it's either going to be Christ who may make demands of you that may cost your life, as it did the apostles. Or it's going to be you, and you're going to do everything to maintain the status quo. That you don't want to risk your life. You don't want to risk a conversation with a co-worker. You don't want to risk your job. You don't want to risk family members turning on you. You don't want to risk any of those things. And so you'll seek to save your life. And if you do that, you're going to deny the Lord by doing so. That is a situation that all of us have either met or you're going to meet. And it's something that Jesus says you do daily. So we have to be aware. What are we giving in exchange for our soul? He gives a second demand that you have to take up your cross. And as we've said before, it is not something where we're talking about just the ordinary burdens of the day. This is taking your instrument of death, the thing that you're going to be nailed to. This is the thing that everyone's going to know that you sacrificed yourself for entirely. You take up your cross, and here's the reason. Because what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Jesus points out that you have the power, you have the right and the ability to make that choice between what you're going to do. Are you going to take up that cross every day and follow the Lord, or are you going to, to deny him because there's things of lesser value? Because Jesus says that by being hung upon the cross, that's more of an exalted position, and that's of more value than everything that the world could offer you. For you to be drugged through the streets as Jesus was and nailed to a cross because of your dedication to doing the will of God is more valuable than everything that the world has to offer because that's the demand that's placed upon your soul. And thirdly, there's a third requirement of discipleship or demand of discipleship, and that's when Jesus says, follow me. And here's the reason. Because if you are ashamed of him and his words when he returns, he's going to be ashamed of you in that day. If we are ashamed to follow Jesus now, he's going to be ashamed of us when he comes back. So again, what are you going to give in exchange for your soul? How much value do you place on it? Do you have a price? You know, when you look into the world and you look at some of the people that we encounter in the world for some of those people, that exchange is an obvious one, what they've exchanged it for. If you go to Matthew chapter uh, 6, verses 19 through 21, here in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Notice the choice that's made. You can lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but the problem with that is, is that they can rust Moth can eat them. Somebody can break in and steal those things from you. But if you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, those types of things don't happen. And no one can take them from you. And so Jesus continues, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whenever we are valuing the, the temporal earthly treasures of this life, these things that we might have and enjoy here on this earth, are we giving our soul in exchange for that? I'm willing to sacrifice my soul for a little more. And we always apply it to money, and I believe that's where Jesus is talking about it. But really, when you continue in these next few verses, he really is equating this to the idea of idolatry. He's really equating it to serving something as being a higher power than God. Because we look at it as being something that delivers us, something that saves our life. But Jesus says you have to deny yourself so that you might follow him. In Luke chapter 12, you remember that there's one in the crowd there as Jesus is teaching. And he says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus asked him, who made me an arbiter between you and your brother? This is not what I'm, that's not what I'm here to do. But he says, beware of covetousness. And he tells this story to illustrate how a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. 
Because as you might imagine in the story, you have this man who has great wealth and he's got a huge problem. He's made so much money off of his land that he doesn't have enough room to store all the, the treasure that he's accumulated in his crops. So he's got this huge problem. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to have to tear down these, other, these barns and build bigger barns. And then he begins to say to his soul, to his soul that now that I've got all these things, everything in my life is laid out. I can take the rest of my life in ease and comfort for many years. And we all remember what God said to that man. You're a fool. This night your soul is required of you. Now who's going to possess all those things? Who's going to have them? What if nobody possesses them? They're just going to rot away. They're just going to blow away. What if you give it to your son and he's not any brighter than you are and he wastes it all because he thinks he can just live his life on it? Jesus warns that we can pursue material blessings, things that satisfy the flesh and give us this false sense of security and they're going to fail us in the end. And we see it constantly with people. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, John remind us, reminds us that there's three types of temptations that come into the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these things are of the world. And you remember that John says that the earth is passing away and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. That's the one who really matters. That's the one who really counts. And so everything that our eyes can behold, everything that our mind wants to possess, everything that we can grab hold of, everything that gives us prestige and honor in this life means nothing if our soul is lost. What are you going to give? What's holding you back to where right now I'm not willing to give my soul over to the Lord's directives because I'm being, and my orders are being dictated by what? What is it? that your life is so wrapped up in. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, and this is an interesting passage of scripture in these heroes of faith where it talks about Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, and talking about the faith of Moses, it says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And notice that he made a choice. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. We know that sin is pleasurable. That's why we engage in it. No matter what that sin may be, even though the sin itself may not be one of those things that we think is a pleasurable thing, the reason we engage in it is because it does give us pleasure. The reason that we get angry is because we take pleasure in being angry. The reason that we worry is because we take pleasure in worrying. The reason that we are afraid is because we take pleasure in fear. Because we think all of these things are going to give us some type of security. They're going to give me something that I need. It's going to make people either listen to me, pay attention to me, yield to me, give me what I want. And this is the means by which I've learned to achieve those things. If you're going to suffer affliction, if you're going to suffer, suffer with the people of God for godly things because this life is full of suffering for the good and the bad. It's better to suffer affliction with the people of God to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season. They're passing away. When you leave home, young person, when you start leaving the, the house, when you start getting independence, when people aren't watching you anymore and you're on your own, don't let this question leave your mind. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Am I really, really willing to give my soul up for this? You think about it when you look on your phone, when you look on your computer, when you go out with your friends, when you pick up that magazine, when you listen to that type of music, when you go to that type of movie. Am I willing to give up my soul? Really? Am I really willing to give up my soul for this? And pray to God that that will be enough to keep you away from it. Choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, even for a short amount of time that it may be. Second Peter chapter 2, we know also that a lot of people give up their souls for the false sense of security and temporal comforts that come from false doctrines and beliefs. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18, <clears throat> Peter here in 2 Peter is talking extensively about false teachers. And he says here in verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness... They allure through the flesh, the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, 
They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they escape the pollution, the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Temporal comforts of false belief that everything is fine, making you feel good and secure where you're at. A religion that never makes you feel uncomfortable or an uneasy or challenges you to grow and to prosper, giving you something to focus on that makes you think that you are better than others because after all, you do this. It's not necessarily something you can find in the scriptures to do. However, it's something that you're doing because it seems to be a good thing. And through that type of allurement, and that is a lust of the flesh, even in that, those types of things, you have to see that it's a false sense of security. We're going to talk about studying tonight and how important study is and engage in some things that hopefully will, will give you more confidence in what you study and being able to use what you study. But understand, false doctrine is everywhere, and it is rampant. And, it's, and brethren, it's not the denominational world that we have the most trouble with. It infiltrates, and our young people are especially susceptible to it. But one of the things that hurts us more than any other is the false doctrines that infiltrate the church. They infiltrate the Lord's people and give us a false sense of security or a false sense of hope or something that we have done or something that we have created that makes us think that we are better. Don't give in to those things. Remember the demands of our Savior. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow Him. That's the secret to maintaining your soul. And so for us, it may be a little less obvious, though. And, and here, I think, are some of the things in, in which... If we really think about them, we might be giving our soul in exchange for. In, in Genesis 3 and verse 1, it talks about the serpent coming to Eve. And if you think about the exchange that Eve, Adam and Eve made, that the serpent comes and asks her, can you eat of all these trees? She knows the commandment. Yes, we can eat of all these trees, except for this one. We're not even supposed to touch this tree. Because if we do, we'll die. Well, you won't surely die. And for the bite of fruit from a tree and the promises that Satan made, she was willing to give up her soul and the fellowship with God and Adam alone with her. And when this exchange happened, it shows just how cunning and crafty, as Genesis 3.1 intimates, how cunning and crafty the serpent is. That he is willing to, to show us something and and we know us against the commandment of god but somehow he's able to make us believe that we're not giving up so much of our soul and that we're not giving ourselves so much to this thing that it's jeopardizing my soul that somehow i can engage in a little bit of this somehow i can i can take part in just a, a small amount of this and if i do this just a little bit then i haven't departed from god entirely and God's not going to send me to hell because of just engaging in a little bit of it. Because after all, I still go to church. I still hang out with the brethren. And you're trying to live in two worlds. And it doesn't work that way. And there's a lot of things like that that may not seem quite as obvious to us. In Luke chapter 8, let's go back to Luke. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, when Jesus is explaining the parable of the sowers, uh, sower and the seed. And he goes into the, seed, uh, to the field to scatter his seed. And in verse 11, it says, the seed is the word of God. And notice some of the things that will cause us to lose our soul and give an exchange for our soul. There, there are those who fall on the wayside. Those are the ones who hear and the devil comes and he takes away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. And so these are these people that it has no effect upon them whatsoever. It's therefore a short amount of time vanishes away. 
But then in verse 13, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in a time of temptation fall away. These are the kinds of people that are mentioned like in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. These are those where Paul says, we are not the kind of people who are supposed to be looking at the things that are temporary, but the things are, that are eternal. That we know that what's going on within us is working for us something that is better. Because we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. And Paul says that this light affliction that we're going through, this is working for us something better. It causes us within this body to yearn for something more. To put off this tent so that we might put on an eternal body. But see, the one in Luke chapter 8 and verse uh, 12 and 13 there, the one who is... Uh, tempted by the, the trials of life and the persecution of life, they don't look at that. They look at this is tough, this is difficult. I'm still being tempted by the things of the world. And because of that, he loses his soul and he doesn't bring any kind of fruit to maturity. Continuing on in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Here again, Jesus talks about how it is that each and every care that we have of the world can be a temptation and struggle. Matthew chapter 6, once again, 25 and following. Do not worry. Jesus says it over and over and over again. So what does Jesus not want us to do? Worry. But we do. And what do we worry about? He clothes the, the grass of the field. The flowers are arrayed more beautiful than Solomon. And what do we worry about? Clothing. If God will clothe something that's going to be here today, gone tomorrow, and thrown into the oven, won't he care for you? Doesn't he care for you? The, the birds of the air, they don't sit around twilling their thumbs about where their next meal is going to come from. But what do we worry about? We worry about food. He takes care of them. Will he not much more take care of you? Do not worry. Get up every day, find the worm. It's there. And God takes care of you. So you don't worry. You seek first the kingdom of God. But see, we have a way of making every care and concern to be monumental. It's a life and death situation. What am I going to do if? What am I going to do now that? And we fill in that blank with all sorts of things. And we end up exchanging our soul for it. We're told in, in Matthew 6 to not worry. Martha and Mary... When Jesus comes into the house, and we know how wonderful a woman Martha was, that Jesus has come into her house, she has this good relationship with Jesus, Jesus loves them, seems to have spent a lot of time with them, and Martha wants to make sure that her, the guest in her house is well taken care of. She is a virtuous woman, and that she wants to make sure that her guest is well tended to. And so she has busied herself with much serving, while her sister Mary sits there doing nothing, listening to Jesus. And she comes in and tells Jesus, why don't you tell my sister to come help me? And Jesus gives a response that is unexpected. She's chosen. She has chosen something that cannot be taken away from her. The service is virtuous. And it is good. And it is beneficial. And there's a world of excuses that can be given for why she did it and why she should have done it but she was still choosing something that could be taken away from her. Mary chose something that could not be taken away from her. This is the ways in which we're tempted. We're supposed to take care of our families. And by taking care of our families, we don't raise our children. We don't attend church services. We don't attend Bible studies. We're too tired to go to the men's studies or the women's studies. We're too busy with life and things that we know we need to be doing that we forsake the things that we must be doing. And brethren, when we do that, that's how Satan is cunning. You won't surely die. Keep doing what you're doing. You won't surely die. You're not giving up your soul for this. You're still, you're still in the house with Jesus. You're still serving Jesus. But you've chosen the things that can be taken away from you, not the things that are eternal. This is how Satan gets to us. In Matthew chapter 19 in verses 16 through 26, let's turn over there. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 26. Because also, 
in the parable of the soils, he talks about the riches that some people will give up their souls for. And in Matthew chapter 19, there's an encounter that Jesus has with this young ruler who's very rich. And this young ruler who's very rich seems to be a very good man. And there's an exchange that takes place about what does a person have to do to inherit eternal life? And the appropriate source is pointed to, well, what, is the, what does the word tell you? Keep the commandments. Well, I've kept the commandments. And I've kept them from the time I was a young man. This young man and Jesus both knew something was lacking. But that young man did not know what it was. Jesus did. And so when Jesus looked at this young man and loved him, he lets him know that if you want to have eternal life, if you want to have this hole in your life filled in, here's how you fill it. All these riches that this young man evidently had been trusting in and believing that this was showing that God approved of him or he thought that since he was blessed that God must be approved. But what's the problem? He didn't possess these things so much as these things possessed him. And so Jesus tells him, take these things, sell them, give it to the poor, and come follow me. What is that thing that you're holding? You know there's a hole. You know there's a gap. You know there's something missing. And it doesn't have to be something that's sinful. It can be something that you think is a virtuous thing. But it's really standing between you and full devotion. What I'm asking you is, what is your blind spot? What's your bias? What is it that when I mention it from the, the pulpit, you tense up and you don't want to talk about it? What is it that you don't want to think about? What is it that if Jesus were to say, you know, you're holding on to that, you don't possess that as much as it possesses you? That's what you've got to find. That's where Satan gets us. That's where it's less obvious. But that's what often we give in exchange for our souls. And lastly, let's go back to Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 8, once again, in that parable. Luke chapter 8. After Jesus talks about the ones who are, are the seed being choked out by cares and riches and pleasures of life. He says in verse 15, But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, when they have heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. These are those like we have in Colossians 3 and verse 2, that when we set our mind, we set our mind on those things that are above. We know that we're not always going to have the things that other people have. That really doesn't matter. Because that's not what my mind is set on. I, I know I'm going to have hardships and difficulty, but everybody has hardships and difficulty. But at least if I'm going to suffer, let me suffer as a Christian and not as someone who's opposed to God. I'm going to set my mind on those things that are above and not on the things of the earth. So what would you give in exchange for your soul? Some people gave their soul up for things like a bowl of soup. Some people gave their soul up for one night with Bathsheba. Some people were willing to exchange their soul for 30 pieces of silver. Sometimes we give our souls in exchange for things like pride, arrogance, anger, wrath, vengeance. See, those things are obvious. But brethren, let us not give up our souls for things like fear, frustration, worry, doubt. Don't exchange your soul for those things either. Because if Satan's going to get you, it may not be with those big sins that we all know no one's supposed to commit. It may be those little things where Satan just tells you, you won't surely die. You'll be just fine. Everything's going okay. There's no need to change. Don't give your soul in exchange for those things. And our life can be more prosperous as, as Christians. Because whatever it is that we forfeit our soul for, that's the thing that you're worshiping. Jesus demands a choice. What's yours, what is yours going to be this morning? Do you have a price? Do you have something that you're willing to give your soul up for? 
If so, that's a bad bargain. No one but a fool would give up their soul for things that are, are temporary in nature. That's what Jesus says. And so if we're going to be faithful to God, let's hold on to that most valuable possession that we have and keep it for eternity. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, if we can help you in any way, won't you please come as together we stand and sing.